wanted to tell you uh, two uh, and some anecdotes. I, um, Father Luis uh, gave the sermon about uh, St. John the Baptist. My mother was from Mexico, from Chihuahua, and she told us on, on the feast of St. John the Baptist, they would go on a picnic. They would go out uh, on a picnic and celebrate St. John the Baptist because they felt that the rivers were blessed, and so they would go out uh, bathing in the water or have a picnic. And anyway, and I think that's what moved me, all these uh, wonderful um, feast days and celebrations in the church. And when people say, well, how did you start? And I, I can't imagine that I would, have, I, I would have been doing my artwork if I didn't have um, this my roots being in the Catholic faith. And, uh, and I wonder, uh, because I'm not really trained, I, I mean, when, when I started, I was 30 years old. And at 30 years old, um, I had gone through a lot of background in social justice, working with um, Father John Cofield in El Monte. That was, that's where I was raised. It was just a small town. I mean, we were from, you know, just working class people. We were probably below the poverty line. Because um, um, I, 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 I keep remembering my mom would tell me, John, take, uh, take these eggs from, we had chickens, and see if somebody will buy them, and then we can buy some milk. It was a, we were kind of below the poverty line. And, um, but she was a, a very resourceful woman, my mom, and she told me stories, and she used to like to tell the stories of the Gospels and the saints, the feast of all of these holy people. And it all sparked my imagination. Um, but it, I never thought about art. It wasn't that I had planned that I was going to be doing art. I, I got it involved. I went to Loyola Mary, or was Loyola then. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, um, a, a co-ed school then. It was just a men's school in 1957. And in 1957, I wanted to be a, a pre-med. I wanted to be a doctor. I felt like a, a work of service would be what I wanted to do. And uh, But I, I didn't really have enough knowledge and uh, academic background, so I, I kind of left school and went to work in a paint factory. I worked seven years in a paint factory. Uh, while I was at Loyola, the one thing that influenced me a lot was the, um, the uh, I did a paper on um, Dorothy Day, but my sister had, had met Dorothy Day because uh, John Cofield was, the, was one of the leaders in our little community, and he had brought Dorothy Day, and so she would get the newspapers from, the, from New York, and then uh, when I was there at, at Loyola, I decided I'd do a, a term paper on her. But I started reading as much as I could about her, and that, real, that really inspired me. I, I mean, more than anything else that I can remember about Loyola were those contact with Dorothy Day. In fact, I, w I was very sad because when I went to the library and asked, do you have any books on Dorothy Day? And they said, are you kidding me? She's a communist. But the uh, Father Marshall that had the periodical said, don't, don't, don't listen, don't worry. Here we have this stacks of Catholic workers and uh, Commonweal. Commonweal would run articles about her and from her. Then when I started working, oh, I did write to her. I said, gee, I would really like to go and work with you in the Bowery and work there with you. And she wrote back and <laughs> she said, listen, I think you don't need to come here to do work of the Lord. You stay in your own community and find ways that you can be of service. That would be more effective than for you to travel over here. I, I think I wanted more community. I wanted more of that community base. Um, and, and Father Cofield was a great influence on us. He was our, our chaplain. We, he started the Young Christian Workers. And the Young Christian Workers was a very important movement for, for me. I, it was, that would have been about 1959 to 1965. And we got involved. Uh, it was, the, the premise was observe, judge, and act. 
And so we were young workers without very much background in ed academic background. But we started to look at things and started to uh, use the Gospels as a way of judging things and assessing and praying about it. And then we'd find action. So the idea was formation through action. And so we got involved with labor. In, 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 we got interested in labor. And then we got interested in voting and getting, and there were many people, this many people in El Monte, and many of them were, were born in, in the United States but had never voted. And so we organized, and we were organizing and registering voters, and we were able to get the first, um, well, at that time it was Mexican-American, into the assembly. Before that, they had John Russolo was our assemblyman, and John Russolo was the head of the um, John Burt Society. So, um, so he was kind of like contradicting all the the social teachings that we had learned in in our um, in, in social justice on the encyclicals. So we were able to get this Hispanic. His name was Ed Soto. He was the first. Assemblyman <laughs> Latino in the assembly in the California State Assembly, and we did it door to door. And then we also worked on civil rights uh, right away. Um, there was this big proposition to take away the Rumford Act that protected civil rights for housing to not discriminate in housing, and we got involved. But the more you got involved, the more you realized you know there's a lot to do, and all of that was got me more on fire to try to carry on. Uh, I, had, I worked in the paint factory, but I was really so involved with this young Christian workers and, um, and the training. We were learning a lot. And we also went to another place here in Los Angeles, was the Catholic Labor Institute. And there was a, a, a priest who later became um, a bishop of Monterey. Uh, Monterey County, I guess, uh, Thaddeus Schubstra, and he taught, um, he taught the encyclicals, and that really inspired us. They were the encyclicals by John the 23rd, Mother and Teacher, and Peace on Earth. In fact, Peace on Earth was so important that the UN had a whole conference, an international conference, on that encyclical. Um, but all of this was inspiring to me. But I, then, I, at the end, I, I left my job at the paint factory. I went full time working on this campaign to protect the housing, and that was a very uh, surprising thing to go out there and go to the parishes. And um, and when I was there in the parishes, uh, we were leafleting, trying to get people to vote to protect and not take away the, um, the, the Rumford Act. That was the act that protected uh, housing from discrimination. Um, the, uh, I left my job. But, oh, the, there was another group that I met when, because we got involved with that uh, working <coughs> against discrimination and to protect civil rights was to uh, the Catholic Labor Institute. Oh, it was the Catholic, no, it was the, the Catholic uh, Human Relations Council of Los Angeles. And that was like a, a, a group of lawyers and professors. It was Bill Fitzgerald from Loyola, who taught there many years, was part of it. It was Oscar Williams, Oscar and Horace Williams. There were two brothers. They were African American. They were the some of the, the first African-American uh, Catholics that I had met, you know, that became friends of mine. I'm still friends with them, even though it's only 50, 60 years now, or 50 years. Um, and, and from there, I, I think that was important. It's all these connections that helped me to see how my faith was connected to uh, social justice. Well, I decided to go to UCLA because people said, well, you'll never get any place. You'll never be able to tell people about uh, work with people. And I thought, well, I'll go into community organizing. But I went to UCLA, and I was going to be an economist, and I failed terrible. It, it was dreadful. 
I mean, I, I was so disappointed after two years, uh, and, and I felt kind of hopeless that I'll never be able to, because I had problems with learning. I had problems reading and understanding. I had problems writing, and I had problems listening and learning like ordinary students were, and everyone was doing ahead, and I was still behind. <laughs> so I left, and then people kept saying, not everyone's meant to go to college, and I, and I felt that that was like a real throwaway, you know, you better go back and get another job. Um, and then, but, uh, so I didn't know what to do. I, I felt like it was the end of the road, and, and my dad had, had left home and was living on Skid Row, and so I had thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to be like my dad. I'm just going to go live on the streets. And not in a way, in a Catholic way, you know, like these great uh, holy people like St. Joseph Le Bray that would just live on the streets and work with poor people and like Dorothy Day and just get a uh, menial job. I remember I was out of work and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I went to this little cafe. It was African-American cafe over by the uh, Pico in Normandy, around there someplace. And then I asked the man, could I get, there was a job for a dishwasher, and I went to ask, and he said, no, no, you white guys, <laughs> you, you know, you're too well trained. You shouldn't be doing this. This is a job that people that don't have the background can do, so don't take this job. You could, but I think I would advise you not to take it. So then I, I went on, but I didn't, I, I picked up all kinds of little part-time jobs, but then I decided uh, to take a, a night class with Corita, and Corita, Sister Mary Corita, that was at Immaculate Heart College, and that was very important. She was like a pivotal because her work dealt with social justice, her artwork, and she, I, she taught a class in lettering, and it was a woman's uh, college at that time, but uh, they let men come in in the ninth class, and so I took this ninth class in lettering. That was all I knew. I mean, I just wanted to do lettering, and then, and then I thought, well, maybe I'll make signs. I can make signs at least. I can go out on the street with signs, and and I, I mean, it was I was so naive. I had no plans about art. I didn't know anything about art. I was not art, no background in art. I. Uh, and then I took the class, and it was uh, very exciting. And she made, she opened doors. It was like you're a closed in. You had no imagination. You had imagination, but it wasn't clear. It wasn't disciplined. She gave me a discipline, and then she showed me there's different ways to go about things. And you can also delight in what you do, and you can enjoy what you do. And uh, so I would put all my and days and working on it, I'd have all these part-time jobs, and then I would, and everything was around this class of lettering. Uh, then someone, one of the students, one of the people that worked was at the, at the school, uh, a friend of mine, she said, John, here's an old silk screen, but don't ask me to teach you how to, how to use it. You have to learn on your own. I don't have time to be showing you. So she gave me this dry, this screen that was all ruined and dried ink, and, and so then I, I said, oh yeah, this is exciting, you know, I can start, I can print, and I could watch the students, they were printing, but I started up doing it in my own, my own little place where I lived. And I, and, and I kept going to the store where they sold the supplies of the silk screens. And then I'd say, oh, and that was right by here. I used to go, it was over here on 8th Street. I used to go right by Union and 8th, and I'd talk to them and say, hey, what do I do now? And they said, oh, that's easy. You buy this, and you buy that. And so I, I just kept learning. And every time I go to the store, the guy says, oh, oh, there's that guy again. You take him this time. <laughs> and so then I, I kept trying and experimenting. And see, I didn't have any academic background. And, and it wasn't that I knew where, where I was going, but I knew it was during the time of social protest. There were people with placards, they were making signs. It was during the time of the psychedelic art and people who had all these posters for rock and roll bands. It was the 
time um, where more art, more people were talking about art, like the Mexican murals, Diego Rivera and C.K. and um, Orozco, all of these were very inspiring because they were the history of the people and a very social history. And uh, th these all influenced me, but I would say that um, probably my faith, uh, the background in my faith helped me a lot. Like I would say, um, uh, we'll go on to um, like the, the biblical stories. Oops, I better take my notes. Okay, uh, the, like I tell you, my mom would tell me stories, and then we'd be reading the Gospels. Well, here's some of the examples of these are works that um, I, they're not in sequence and chronological, but this is you can see the colors are m much more brilliant. I, I feel so sad I didn't um, I don't have a real crisp images for you, but it's very subdued. This. Can no, it them? doesn't work. We Can tried. We down, try oh, sure. Is it like oh, anyway, so the, the, here's the story of Lazarus, which the, there's an emotional element in it that I always think about Jesus weeping before the tomb that he cared so much. So that part moved me. Um, I don't know if it's that helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it does help. Oh, hold it, Blasta. You said it didn't help. <laughs> no, it was just we didn't know we're trying to sound. Oh, by the way, later on, uh, Phil said not to pick him up now because he didn't want you rifling right, right through the cards. But you, there's cards for of everything. And then you can get one of each card. And I have a whole bunch of really, uh, as much information as I can get gathered together. So at the end, please come by and get them. Um, anyway, so, uh, so there's a story on the, oops, Chris, am I flashing that thing? What? We're doing good so far. No, what's the next one? Oh, story of Ruth. Okay, this is the story of Ruth. And that's another element in the, the idea of narrative. And so as I was doing my work, I, was, I, I wasn't just doing it from my own um, inner, I mean, my imagination was opened up, but I mean, I had icons to look at. That was another big influence, icons and uh, religious art that moved me. That was the first art that I ever saw. I didn't really go to museums or study art. But I was 30 years old, kind of just starting out with not knowing, and everyone would be, would be telling me, John, your life is ruined, you go back to college. Or people would say, get out and get a real job and start making some money and get married and get a, and get a home and get a new car. I had my old jalopy. I said, listen, that's not what my life is about. Um, I'm so, I'm just getting, so I stayed with this. So now I've been doing this 46 years, but there was no plan. There was no path. I didn't. I didn't every time, every couple of years, I'd say I can't do this anymore. I'm going to give up. Then all of a sudden, I started a new project and forget it. Start, <laughs> or else I, 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 I had lived in England for four years. I went away. And it was really great England. I learned a lot living there. But I, when I came back, I went to a gallery that used to sell my work, and they said, "Here's my work." And they said, "Well, we don't like that work. Here's our new, our new uh, artist, and we really like his work, and we're really selling it. And it's mark. We're able to market it." And it was, and so then it was somebody that had gotten um, a lot of attention, and he had a, a distributor and a and an agent, and they were putting a lot of money into this. And so then, then I, I went to work with this framer that I knew that, um, and he, he said, yeah, you can come in and help me. And, I, and then that was the artist that, that they had told me, 
this is the artist at the gallery. Then I went to work for this framer, and he said, this is the artist where everyone likes and we're framing. So I was framing and said, what am I doing framing this guy's work? He's my competition. <laughs> Not that I felt that there was need for competition, but this is who I was being replaced by. Then I, then I, then I went, a friend of mine said, well, there's a, a, um, a, the studio, they're looking for someone to help um, make the silk screens of a silk screen studio for an art, you know, for artists. And so when I went there, that was the artist that they were going to, they asked me if I could break down, they look at the picture and break it down in different colors so that they could print it. And then I, I thought, well, this is the man, this is the same man. He's following me all over and he's telling me, no, you get back and get back to your work and don't give up so easy. Anyway, these are examples. I just, that's a side story. Anyway, these are examples of, of the way I took the narrative and the storytelling in the church. Bye, Dan, you're going to go now. Thanks, Dan. You, you're going to miss a real good story. I'm like a down Merrifield. I'm sorry. I'll tell you another time. Thank you. Okay, next. Let's. We better move fast. Oh, this is another one. Of, and at Mission Dolores, they did the um, the grand. Um, they do the play, the passion play. Not every year. That Mission Dolores is over here in, in the the projects. And I went there and I was so moved by it that all these people had learned all their parts, made their costumes, and then they were out in the streets. And also I was inspired by Labor Day uh, marches. And so I combined uh, Palm Sunday into, so it was like the Passion Play meets a Labor Day parade. Anyway, the painting was purchased by um, uh, the cathedral, uh, the large painting. And if, if when you come over, there's a uh, Life magazine that has that picture. You'll see it. Okay. They, they, they made a double spread. These are details from it. Where is the cathedral? I don't know. They bought it, but they don't put it up. <laughs> <laughs> ask, ask Brother Hilarion. Uh, anyway, this is another example of narrative, the storytelling, and I and I mean it's not that people say, well, that's unique to my work, but it isn't because it's from ancient art. I found so many examples of people doing storyboard and uh, in, in in all kinds of art. So I was learning. It wasn't that I that I I couldn't learn. I could learn visually, and so I looked and then I I kept trying new ideas. This is an older work. Uh, the Abraham and Isaac, and it's in four parts. Okay. And the, here's another one, the story of Joseph, and that's also um, a, a narrative, and I used many scenes, there's nine uh, panels in it, uh, but to tell the story. But see, these are all things coming from my faith, from my being, you know, read the readings in the, in the, at the different liturgies. Okay, go on. Uh, then the other thing would be the poetry that was part of the liturgy and the reading uh, also inspired me not only the narrative but like here's the Psalm uh, 23. This, this one um, would be, though I walk in the valley of the deep shadows, I'm not afraid for you walk with me. And this is, these are, this is a paragraph that I, this is my last paragraph that I did and it, um, it took me eight months to print it. And it has 47 printings of color, but uh, it's uh, it's very intense colors. If you look at the, the this monitor here, you can get an idea of the the colors, the layers of colors and layers of colors. Okay. And then this is Psalm 85, and this is an important one, mostly because my mom loved trees, and she planted uh, fruit trees. And when I remember we had a fig tree, and she called me and she said, John, come over quick, the, the fig tree is dying. Some uh, animal had eaten the roots, um, um, a gopher, and it was dying. And she was crying about the tree. I, I, can't, re I can't forget that the tree meant so much to her. 
And, um, but then I, I also look at the farm workers movement and this whole idea that generosity in the land and how some people have more than others and but the, the land is supposed to be generous and like God's giving it for everyone to share. So this is Psalm 85, justice and peace shall kiss, truth shall spring out of the earth, kindness and truth shall meet, and justice shall look down from the heavens. So I have the words coming out of it. This, this is a, uh, one of my favorite words. And then the other reading, of course, this was popularized during the, that time of Kennedy and uh, Pete Seeger. Uh, Kennedy read this in his inauguration, and Pete Seeger put this song together um, from the Ecclesiastes, There's a Time for Everything Under Heaven, and that inspired me. That was one of the first things I did in 1969. It was just an outline. I mean, I, I, I worked a month on, on the screen, and all I did, it came out like a black a wood block print. And then many years later, 30 years later, I had colored one. And then that became this one. But, but it originally was like, but it was a framework that I had done, but it was so exciting. Because I'd never done anything like that before. And to spend one month, on something, it, it gave me the courage to say, oh my God, I can do this, I'm going to do something better next time, I'm going to, but it, I was so delighted, even though it was so mediocre and so amateurish, but it didn't bother me because I started at the bit, at the base, I started with nothing, so to me it was, was the best thing I'd ever done. Uh, Is it Smithsonian has the Ecclesiastes? And okay. Oh, I and the um let's see. Oh, these are the parables. I'm showing you the parables. Uh, this is uh, this is an early silkscreen. Oh, people say, well, why are why are you doing printmaking? I'll tell you this, as a, as an artist. Oh, well, I wasn't even an artist, but I used to go out on the street and sell my work. But to sell one painting, it took me so long to think of an idea that I had to do it as a silk screen, and then I could, uh, then I could um, reach people. And so I would work, and I would print, and then every two or three weeks, I'd have a new work, and I'd keep bringing works out. So this was my very early work, 1970. And, but then, over the years, working in different workshops, I learned, and I, I mean, my technique, it wasn't that it's so grand and so um, technically, it was just that I spent so much time growing in the technical part that I was able to produce things that were more difficult. Okay, as one can see in that um, procession that's in the front there. Okay, so this is, how it came out in 2000, so that would be 32 years later, you know, but it's very elaborate work. So I keep going back to older work and revising it and refining them. Oh, and also I was influenced by, in the, in the um, Huntington Library, they have this uh, Hopper's Bible, which was really inspired me that in the old days, even though people couldn't read, they were making, they were printing books that were visual so that people could look at the pictures and they knew them. So even poor people could know the stories by visual. And that's how I like, because I'm a more visual, not very intellectual. And so here's the, the scene in three parts, the good Samaritan, okay, go ahead. And then this is an, an early version in 1984 of the prodigal son. But I had done earlier prodigal sons, but this was the most elaborate. I, I even added little um, little notes. I have this uh, the journey of the prodigal son. Then I have the mother lighting a candle in front of his uh, his photo, and then I have a, a supper there where he where there's an empty chair and the family are saying grace, but they're wondering what happened to their prodigal son. So. Uh, then this was 84, then I went back uh, and then I, I did this one in 2004, that's 20 years later. 
and this is very elaborate. This is one of the, one of the. Um, there's so many details, and it's so rich in color. But well, you can see it right here. But it's layers and layers of color over color. And okay, so it's, so the parables in the uh, gospels and in the reading. So I'm saying this is coming out of my faith. Okay, go ahead. And the other thing that inspired me a lot were my mosaics in the church. And uh, one of the big influences were the local, these two women, the Pichek sisters, Isabel, and I can't remember the first, who was the other, her sister, she just died. They were two women, and they uh, did um, amazing work. The first painting I ever saw in a church was in San Gabriel, in the, um, St. Anthony's Church, and they had two big murals, and, and I used to go and look at them, and was very inspired. But anyway, this is mosaic. This is at Concordia University, and it's eight feet by six feet, and it's based on an earlier work. Uh, and they sent it to Italy, and they had uh, about uh, seven uh, people working on it. It took them four months to put it together. And then recently, this this is another work. It's a long work. It's called the River, and it's about the baptism. Oh my God! It's about the baptism. But I, but because of the stories that my mom tell me about the picnic, I have people doing all kinds of things around the river. And uh, this uh, Met, this Lutheran church in in uh, Glendale, they said, could we? Um, we want to put it on our on, on their bell tower or their tower, and so then I, I gave them permission, and they sent it off. Uh, Judson Studios facilitated. They sent it to Italy, the image, and then they they built it, and then they installed it. They these mosaics in Italy, but if you go to it's over in uh, in Glendale, uh, Saint Matthew's Lutheran Church. Concordia College, go ahead. Concordia College has, that's over in Irvine. Oh, I just wanted to show you the stained glass windows. I, I'm so enamored of stained glass windows. Whenever I traveled around Europe or wherever I could, and here there's such great um, stained glass windows on 3rd. St. Brendan's. Thanks, I was trying to think of that. They're so beautiful, and also in the um, the seminary in St. John's, there's some beautiful um, windows done by Irish stained glass window makers. There also is the USC, the Crusoe Catholic Center, has eight fabulous stained glass windows featuring the attitudes. Our Savior Church. That's okay, I don't want to hear about all this right now. I'm still in my old times. I'm not looking at the old ones, but I did see them when I went to the to the Judson Studios. I saw those windows that they were making. Anyway, so these are windows that were based on this work, and they let me design it. But it was just a, this strange configuration window. Okay, go ahead. And then um, this Lutheran church. Oh, that was that. Go back a minute. That was at a Lutheran uh, church called Grace. Hill Avenue Grace Lutheran, and they made a whole chapel with my work. It's got an artwork all around it. But anyway, uh, this is their chapel, and that's in Pasadena, right by City College. Okay, go ahead. Then there's another Lutheran church in in San Diego, Christ Lutheran, and uh, they had these strange windows. They were ob oblong windows. They were tall. And they had this one window of a crusader cutting the head off of a moor, or you know, like a Turk or somebody, you know, like the Crusades. And so they didn't want it anymore because so it kind of brought more and more animosity towards people of other faiths. So then they decided to put another window. They chose this. They chose my art. They called me, and I went to Judson, and it was interesting because the, their artist, who was from um, um, Hungary, he, he drew it, and it was more elaborate, it was a better drawing than mine, and then they said, 
they sent it to the church, and the church said, well, that's not John's artwork. We want John's on drawing. So then they called me back. They were miffed that their art wasn't accepted, but they wanted the cruder work of mine. Anyway, so this is like this, and it's in that church. I just wanted to show you about that. And then this is the uh, altarpiece at the at this uh, Hill Avenue Grace Lutheran. It's uh, the triptych and there are tall panels of the nativity and the epiphany and the shepherds. But they're all interconnected by the, the horizon line. Okay. And then this is a, a painting that book is in a, uh, it's a large painting that's in a um, Episcopal church in San Diego called All Saints, or All Souls Church. And, um, it was so big, I'd never done anything like that. Oh, it was originally going to go to St. Joseph's, but I spent so long on it, I couldn't afford to give it to him for the price that he wanted. So he got mad, and then I said, well, I'll make you another one. I'll make, I'll, I painted another fisherman, and I think he felt I was greedy for money. And, he, and, he, and, and I said, well, it will cost you, um, I think I charged him 2000 for it this large painting of the fisherman. It's at St. Joseph's Church in downtown, over here in the garment industry. As you walk in, and he said, how much is it? I said, it will be, but please sign it over to, it was, I signed it to the Placita because that was Father Louis Olivares and Father, um, what's his name? The church was? No, no. Uh, Mike Kennedy. Mike Kennedy and, and uh, Louis Olivares were doing this big thing on, for the Salvadorians and working to protect the Salvadorians and keeping track of what was going on. And so then, and they, had, and so then I said, "Well, write it out to them." So he, he was a little bit surprised uh, because I, instead of taking, he thought I was trying to get more money for myself. I mean, I have to live, but. But I, I thought this was a chance instead of taking that money in to use it for uh, these people in, that were working for justice in El Salvador. And, and Louis Olivares was one of my great heroes. Anyway, so then, I, so this didn't go to St. Joseph, so then I, I took it to an exhibit at this church in San Diego, and it was so big, I had to get a big box to, to protect it, then I had to rent a panel truck to haul it. I thought, this is not going to work. I can't afford to be making pictures this big because I can't be hauling them all around. So then, uh, once I brought it there, this church is right by the ocean. And then they said, well, we don't want you to take it. We're going to keep this picture. They, they took about eight to 10 years to pay me off. They would pay it in little bits and pieces. It turned out to be good because then I'd always have some money coming in when I thought I was totally broke. <laughs> but it was it was exciting. It's it's really a you can see it over there, the colors. Anyway, what's next? Let's see. Oh, then I wanted to show you some of the uh, scenes about social justice. And this is a poster. This is kind of reminiscent of the influence of. Um, of Diego Rivera, and it's it's many scenes. Look, I guess we're gonna lost this walking over here. We better move fast. Well, it's not that. I just when people start walking, I just think that this is that over. No, I don't feel bad. No, I don't feel bad. Okay, keep talking. Who's anybody that actually needs to come down here and grab your stuff and get out? <laughs> well, not, you don't have to be that fast. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, this is a very elaborate poster, and it took me years. And it's based on a, on a, on a little silk screen that I did, because I used to do, uh, in 1972, I did one that was just a very simple outline with colors in it that I printed. And then I, I spent years painting on this silk screen. And then eventually, I felt that it had to be out where more people could see it. So I put all this money on it, and I printed these posters, and we got them all over the place. They're in all the labor schools and as many places and whenever I, uh, kids from colleges come over 
for uh, people that I, I'm giving a talk, we usually give them out to people. They're, 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 it's a big poster and it's very powerful. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I told you about Korea and working with Korea. I still have the stamps. We, we carved all these alphabets out of rubber erasers. And I still recently, I, I, I did a, a poster, but let's go on. I did, this one I did, I, this is a reissue, but in 1972, the farm worker said, would you be able to do a poster for fundraiser? And I said, yeah, so I made this poster. It, it only went to here at that time. It was very primitive the way, I didn't have very refined uh, techniques and abilities, and I didn't have any, hardly any money, but we made this poster. Then recently, uh, when I was with Father Chris Winnett, and uh, they were on a uh, they were on a, on a march for uh, peace in, in in the war in the Middle East. We went by the uh, uh, Occupy LA, and then I thought, well, I, I'm going to bring back some of these old posters. So then I went back and uh, did it, but with more uh, human uh, and more refinement. Okay. But those are all the alphabets that I carved out of rubber erasers. So from 72, okay. Sister, come and get some of those cards there. Oh, you got them already? Okay. Then this was the, the brand new one that I did, uh, that, that I just did last year. Um, I, and I, instead of using photos, I just took drawings. And uh, this, uh, th this has been a real big hit for students and also the center or at Boston University, where, where Martin Luther King went, they um, they asked me if, I, if they could put it in their collection. But many colleges have sent them out, and people that are working for social justice. And it's a it's his, his sermon that he gave that was on peace, and he and he talked about the war, and it, it was a, it was done in 1967. And I thought it was so powerful. So I just used all these alphabets that I had carved, then stamped them out. And then I, my, my colleague, Chris, the guy that works with me, scanned them and then we assembled them together. Okay, good. Then, re and two years ago, um, they were having the, um, the death penalty. So I had all these, uh, well, I had this one, and these two drawings that I was working on for Emory, they wanted a um, DVD of artwork on Lent. And so then what I did is I had already these drawings. So then I thought, well, why not include them in the, um, in the campaign to stop the death penalty? So first we took this one and we made a little card and then we started to make posters. Then I decided, then we made another version of it. Then we I had this painting, then we made one of that. And then I decided instead of just doing just one scene of the, the crucifixion show that it was done by many people who were being crucified. And, um, and it's like uh, the history of, of the death penalty. They're killing so many people. So uh, so we used these. We made little cards, then we made posters, and they went all over the state. And uh, more churches all of a sudden started to make the, the connection between the crucifixion and state sanctioned uh, death, death penalties. Okay. But the guys that helped me said, well, when are we going to get down to work and making some money? We're, we're just sending these posters out to all these people all over the, the, the state. Oh, this was on the three stripes. And so this was part of, uh, this was an old work. I brought it back to put for three strikes. So we made uh, cards and sent them all over. This fortunately did pass. Okay, go ahead. And then uh, Loyola, when they had their big conference on uh, the Bellarmine Forum on uh, Restorative Justice, they used this as their poster, one of the posters. Okay. And this is a series of five small paintings. And I, I just wanted, to, uh, they decided to make a poster using some of these. 
So this was for that um, Bellarmine form. They made the posters. Um, and there are, these are two new posters. And uh, we have a card uh, by the later you could have you could have one of the cards. I changed it a little bit, but they're available for all of you. But uh, I had gone to Mass, it was, actually this is so new, I just did it, uh, did it oh, January. January. But I had been doing the draw, the lettering, and it's from the Mass, and it's the Prayer of Reconciliation, it's one of the Eucharistic prayers. So I put it here in this lady's writing, and then this was the first reading in uh, Lent. I mean, Advent, the first uh, the first uh, week of Advent. And then um, this, I repeated that Eucharistic prayer, but then I took old drawings and I put in the newspapers, I put text. There. One of them has Mandela, uh, a quote from Mandela and from Pope uh, Francis. Okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, okay. Go ahead. This is this is to show you how I start out. I mean, anyone can do this. This is just these are just uh, doodlings to prepare. I've been thinking about a procession. Then this is another um, drawing to prepare. It's you know, just getting ready because I had been to a, a wonderful procession, and I decided I was when I I had lived in England four years, and when I got back, I went to. Arizona to Tucson, Arizona, and I saw this procession in honor of Father Tino, and it was so beautiful. I mean, it was at night, and all these natives from um, Arizona, New Mexico, from Mexico, from the tribes in Mexico, and they were there, and it wasn't like to show off. It was a procession in honor, and it was very spiritual, and, and I got very excited. Okay, so then I decided I'm going to make my own. So that's 1981. This is half, it took me 14 months to make this painting. Okay, and this is shows you in, okay, go ahead. This is a painting, and I, because we're in the Merrifield Center, I wanted to tell you, so I had this uh, procession, and then I, I thought, well, I made uh, postcards, and I made posters, and then I, I wrote to the Vatican, I said, well, would you be interested? Uh, I could send you a poster if you'd like. And then they wrote back and they said, no, we are more interested in the painting. And then, uh, and then, then what do you do then? Uh, I didn't know what to do. Well, and then he said, well, why don't, I'm going to be traveling through the United States with this exhibition called The Treasures of the Vatican. That would have been about 1980. Two or eighty-three, I think. And so when I'm in San Francisco, maybe I could see the picture. And so then I drove up with the painting and showed it to him. Said, "Yeah, we really want this in our collection. It's a mo collection of modern religious art." But he said, "But you know, we don't buy any work." <laughs> well, he said, "But you have to find a sponsor, someone that will buy it and then give it." And I was kind of disappointed when I drove back and I wondered what to do. And then it turned out that Don Merrifield, Father Don Merrifield, was one of my patrons. He really liked my work and he was um, buying it. I don't know where he was buying it, from different galleries. And he said, hello, John. I had, I had talked to him before and he was very kind and, and I was surprised that I had such a good ally. And then he said, uh, what's cooking? He said, well, I just got back and I told him the story. And he said, oh, that's not a problem. We're going to do a fundraiser and we'll buy it from you. Uh, and he said, we're going to ask uh, 100 people for $100. Oh, I asked $10,000. That was a lot of money, but it was 14 months. And it probably was the best picture that I, you know, most elaborate work. Um, and so then he did it. He, didn't, he only raised 6000 but I, I was so tired by the end of that. I said, okay, let it go. I can't hold on to this anymore. And so then he sent it to the Vatican. And it was in the, in the office of the, of the uh, director. 
And because in 19, so that was 83, they sent it, Loyola sent it. Then I went to visit in 1991 uh, to the, I was in England printing, and then I went to the Vatican and I said, well, I'm going to come and visit and show you what I'm doing. And then I went into this office, this beautiful office, and he had the painting there. I said, but why is it here? I want it out there where people can see it. They said, well, more important people see it in my office. <laughs> and I said, well, I still like it outside better. But then his assistant was walking me through, because I wanted to see this altar that had been, um, that had been done by this uh, sculptor that, of John the 23rd. I can't remember his name, but he, he's a wonderful sculptor. Anyway, um, I asked the, the guy, I said, did he just bring it up because I'm visiting, or did he, or is it there? And he said, oh no, it's always there. It's not because you came over. I said, oh good. At least, <laughs> that's okay. But recently, he left, maybe about five or six years ago, he left, and the new director put it out. And so people are coming over to me that go to the Vatican. They say, hey, Mr. Swanson, we saw your painting in the Vatican. I said, oh my god, finally it's out there, because otherwise people would say, we're going to the Vatican, we want to see it, and you have to get permission, you have to call them up and make an appointment. So now they can just see it. And it, it says you enter into the um, Sistine Chapel, it's right there, uh, and there's all these little galleries. Anyway, so that's what happened, that was 83 actually, or 82 when I finished, okay. Now, in 19, or 2007 or 2006, I started to uh, make the, the, a serigraph of it. This was supposed to be my last big work. And so you can see, to, in order to break down the color, I have to make a drawing for each color. And, that, and I have to use magnifiers. Okay, so we'll just show you real quick. Go ahead, move ahead. And then here it is on the screen, one of the, wherever it's white, it's where the ink's going to come through. Wherever it's blue, it's, it starts, it's starting to get dark. I mean, that's where it's blocked out. Okay, keep going. Mixing the ink, you can see where we're testing the colors. Here are some of the separate colors, you know, the different printings, just to show you the layers. It has 89 printings. Here's the silk screen. Okay, go ahead. This was the printer. He just died uh, recently. And then here's where I'm uh, stacking the, um, the, the each each uh, paper to dry, each printing. We, we have to let it dry. Okay, keep going. And, and I have to inspect to make sure that there's no um, no um, misprinting. Okay, go ahead. So this is it. It had 89 overlays. It took me one year to print. And it was supposed to be my last work. But anyway, when you have a chance, walk over here and look at it very carefully. It has 54 scenes, like miniatures. And they're all very carefully printed. They're like little uh, Persian miniatures. OK. That's just comparing. That's OK. Move on. Oh, from, that, from this uh, uh, procession, there was this little painting so I made, I made, I, when I printed it, this is how it looked. Okay, now uh, I decided to do something simpler, so I decided to do a Last Supper. So I'm taking one work out of this drawing and making a larger work. Okay, go ahead. So this is it. But the interesting thing was it was supposed to be very simple and not very complex. I had this wonderful border all around it, so I decided I'm going to put um, scenes, and I have 78 pictographs of people planting and growing things and showing how, we, in order to have the Last Supper, there would have to be all these people planting and growing food and harvesting and preparing the food. So I have all kinds of scenes of people working. And then I also um, decided I was going to put uh, Matthew 25. And Matthew 25, oh, never mind, go back, let me just go back a minute. So these, these are some of the pictographs. They're small, and it took me a long time to do this. But they're really exciting uh, little drawings. And the concept is the sacred is in the ordinary. The ordinary is in the sacred. OK, go on. 
So when I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you fed, you visited me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. So those are some of the scenes. In it. Okay. And then this from uh, I just wanted to show those that border was influenced by other work that I had done. So this had been done earlier, but I just wanted to put this idea of dance, the dancing table okay, in. And there's a, a scene of Jonah in it, and I had done this in 83, this, uh, the story of Jonah. It's a lithograph, and it has uh, 12 panels around it to tell the story. And then, um, uh, see, I keep using, I keep, to do it, to be an artist is working, reworking, going back to an old idea and developing it. So, so this is uh, from 1993, and then this was in the 2007 in, the, in my uh, procession. You can see right in the top, in the top middle part, there's this little scene. Then this is in my Last Supper. So I keep using the same thought, but reworking. Okay, go ahead. There was a dream of Jacob in the Last Supper, and this is an early version of the, the, the dream of Jacob. Okay. And then from those little scenes that were around the Last Supper, I, someone said, make a Madonna. You've got to make a Madonna. And I said, no, I don't want to make a Madonna. Every artist in town does a Madonna. I'm not that kind of artist. I don't do Madonna, so don't bother me with Madonnas. <laughs> and I don't draw that way. But then I thought, well, I've got all these workers. I'm going to make the Madonna the worker. No one has a Madonnas with workers all around her because she would know what it was like. She was so poor, she would be digging, she would be watering plants, she would have to harvest. So I have her surrounded by workers. So I did do it, and all these scenes were from the Last Supper. So I'm, I'm, I'm resourceful, I'm taking out from my old work and putting them into this. Okay, that was 2010, okay, go ahead. So the dream of Jacob, I just want to show you, this is from 86. Uh, now I want to show you, this is from 74, I did this, 1974, so that's going back early, 74, 86, and now, and I, I, this, before the man died that I worked with printing, we were going to do um, another Dream of Jacob, but it was going to be, uh, it's called The Ladder of Ascent, it's like all these uh, you know, people keep going to higher levels of, um, of a spiritual life. And so I, it's actually the guy's dreaming. He could be Jacob, but he could be any of us. And they keep climbing higher and higher. It's still uh, an unfinished work, but I just wanted to show it to you. Okay, is that it? Okay, keep going. So you're just seeing some of the works that are in the, some of the works. Here's a uh, Francis, and it has uh, all these scenes all around him, little pictographs. Okay, it's Francis meeting the wolf, and here's David and Goliath. Oh, the readings were about David. I, I was so um, impressed by the reading. I, I hadn't read, heard that before, but that he would sing, and how song, and how music was so important to the worship. And, and I think that that's what inspired me a lot in being a Catholic, too. But anyway, that was David and Goliath. Here's St. Michael the Archangel. This is really like an icon in a way. Some people say it's the most Mexican work I've done because it looks like these Mexican Baroque angels. Mm -hmm. But then Chinese people say it looks like a Chinese because it's all the dragon and then the, all these colors. But this was a really... Um, uh, it's a really brilliant work. You can see over here that some of the kind of colors. Um, it was only after I had done that in 2006 that I could start the procession. I couldn't really just do the procession at the beginning. It, it was so tech and so complex that I had to have levels of expertise in every everything you do. You keep learning. You keep learning. And at one point, I said, "Okay, I can do it. I can do it." Now. And this was the, the one that helped me to feel like I could go to the next level. Okay, go ahead. That's it. Okay, thanks a lot. You are patient. <laughs> well, thank you.